to this uh, webinar writing sprint about uh, GDPR and training um, how to organize GDPR compliant events. And um, it's uh, an event which is organized by uh, community of practice for training coordinators. Uh, and if you're not part of this community yet, uh, please consider joining if you coordinate training activities in your organizations or projects. Um, that's uh, a page on the Open Air website uh, which uh, describes this community. And, uh, it has a calendar of our meetings. We have a Slack channel. And uh, join us uh, if you're not a member yet. Sir. And uh, here is an agenda for today. Um, so we'll have uh, two presentations. Uh, Prodromos Talvas, uh, legal advisor of uh, Asina Research and Innovation Center in Open Air and uh, Walter Schulger from uh, Austrian Center for Digital Humanities, University of Graz, who will talk about the GDPR and um, consent form wizard uh, that Walter with his colleagues developed uh, that includes uh, training activities. Um, and then um, we'll um, go to three breakout rooms and uh, we'll spend uh, half an hour uh, working on um, checklists uh, and uh, model voting uh, for three types of uh, activities uh, when we think about training events. So usually we have some activities before the event, during the event and after the event. So that's how we suggest to organize our second half of the hour. So please think about uh, the room you'd like to go, whether it's uh, just one, two or three, whether you want to talk about since before, during or after the event. Um, and uh, I'll explain uh, when we move closer to breakout rooms, I'll explain uh, what exactly we'll be covering uh, in those breakout rooms. But I think you you can actually guess. Uh, so then I'm stopping sharing. And um, if Pro is here, then uh, it's over to Pro with some in introductions to GDPR and training. If he's not here yet, then maybe uh, maybe you you go with your presentation, Walter. Sure. Um, hold on, just give me a second, and I'll get right into the. Can you hear me now? Ah, <laughs> good. Excellent. Yeah. Sorry, I had uh, I had a problem with my other laptop and uh, it just switched laptops. Then over to you, Pro. Okay. Um, let me start. I don't know to what extent it does. Anyone, everyone listen to, can hear us now. Um, are we starting? Well, already yeah. started. Yes. Excellent. So apologies for that. Was trying to uh, uh, basically uh, make sure my computer works. So <laughs> what I will do is to actually um, in the next ten minutes to to go very quickly through um, uh, the basics of uh, GDPR, but uh, truly some fundamentals just to make sure that we all talk about the same thing. Um, so I'll uh, point at specific slides, but I can share with you. Uh, later, a more um, generic presentation, uh, which I think is useful to have it as a basis uh, for, for items you would like to explore further. Uh, plus, from previous webinars we have introduced here, uh, I also have a collection of cases which may be relevant not just in relation to what we're discussing today, 
but in relation to the broader concepts and question of data protection for researchers and open research. I don't know if you can see it now. You should be able to see it, yes? Okay, I'm not going to go full screen just to, to, to go to the first uh, uh, item. So um, the first thing which I want to, to say is that um, if we see the data protection, the general data protection <coughs> uh, regulation, uh, GDPR, and we read uh, the title, we will see that this is very much about uh, a piece of uh, legislation that has to do not just the protection of natural persons, as you can see here, um, but also the free movement of data. So one of the key elements of this, uh, of this um, regulation is how to support the free flow, the free movement of data within the digital single market. And this is an important thing to take into consideration because um, you, we have to read it as a legal instrument that actually tells you how to share data effectively. That's what it does. And in this process, how to protect, of course, the natural persons of whose, uh, whose data we are, we are processing. So we always have this kind of uh, link between protection and flow of data that this uh, directive, this uh, regulation tries to, uh, to, to balance and to create. Now, um, before moving to um, the mechanics of GDPR, I just want to share with you a couple of definitions, which I think are quite useful. First thing, we, when we talk about personal data, we talk about any information related uh, to a person that can be identified or is identified. And that gives us, give, gives us a, a very wide um, spectrum of data, uh, which can be linked to a natural person and constitute personal data. Uh, so if we see a list of things that we, we, we see uh, as personal data, of course, his name and last name, addresses, email, IP uh, addresses, et cetera, and what is interesting here is that uh, precisely um, when, we, when we're doing an event, um, there are certain things we will certainly see. For instance, uh, uh, a name and, and last name, we will require them for the event we are uh, developing. And in that sense, they're classic personal data. But it's very, frequently, very frequent that we are finding personal data within documents. And now this is not entirely, this is not the subject of today's presentation, but it's important for you as a general knowledge. It's very, um, not it's very rare, but it's not the common thing that you find the personal data as such. You don't find them as data. Uh, very frequently they exist in other documents and that's what creates issues. Even if you think about registration forms uh, now because also of COVID, but also because of non-personal, non-face-to-face um, uh, -face events, uh, these are um, these would happen through online registration forms. But imagine in the past we would have the registration forms themselves, and the data would be included. Um, so it's very frequent that we don't find the personal data uh, as such, but rather included in other documents. Uh, and also uh, another important thing to remember is that um, whenever we have an, an online transaction, uh, especially on on. Uh, in relation to a website, uh, when we have cookies, these cookies contain personal data and they have to be treated accordingly. It practically means if we run a website for an event and contains cookies, we have to make sure, uh, and, and this is the most recent um, uh, guidelines by the uh, European Commission, um, we have to make sure that uh, we specify which the cookies are, which of them are essential, which improve performance, which are, the, are being used for marketing purposes, and be able to differentiate between essential cookies for the operation of the web page and non-essential cookies and provide at the same level the ability to the data subject to choose whether she wants to get personal data to be processed or not. And this is a major departure from what we have seen in the past, which was basically at the best a notification about the, their data, their personal data being um, processed. So what do we mean when we talk about uh, uh, processing data? By the way, we have two categories of personal data. We have simple personal data and we have what is now called special special category, special categories of personal data, which is what we used to call sensitive data. And here, these are relevant to us when we are, have a registration form and we ask again people to provide some of this data that you see on the screen, on your screens, 
Um, and, and it's not that we normally go to ask about uh, genetic data or biometric uh, data unless they are somehow linked uh, to the attendance uh, because we don't have now physical attendance. So even in, in high security places, we're not going to ask these this things. This happens only online. But it could be that we are asking other questions, mostly in terms of demographics or other types of things we want to know. We have to be careful if we provide health data. A classic thing we would see in the past, and again, I'm talking about physical events, would be we would ask about dietary uh, preferences or would, we would ask about health conditions. This would be sensitive data. And in that sense, we, have, we would have to be more careful uh, with them. Uh, now, the other um, uh, element which is interesting is the processing. What is processing? Processing, if you see here, the list um, that the, uh, the GDPR provides as a definition, you see it's pretty much everything under the sun. So it is whatever you do with the data, accessing, um, recording, collecting, altering, um, whatever you do, basically with the data. So it's, it's really wide, but what is really useful for us is to actually think them in terms of three uh, distinct phases. And I, I use that as an analytic method in order to uh, ensure that for each type of processing, you have, as we will see later, a legal basis and an objective, and, and that's a, a crucial thing. So normally the data, you the, the life cycle of data has three stages as it happens with any type of data set, not just personal data. The first thing is to collect the data. And there are two ways to do it. One is by the data subject. The other thing is, is by a third party, which operates as a data controller or as a data processor. And I'll explain to you what that means or to find them publicly. Now, why this is relevant to us. Let's say that you want to actually send uh, an invitation to a mailing list to a number of people. How would you do that? You need to have the emails at the list to say, of the persons to which you want to send the invitation. How have you compiled this uh, mailing list is quite important. So is it something that the, the, the data subject has given to you directly as an institution? Have you, and when you obtained that, did you explain to them what you're going to do with this data? And very frequently we have mailing lists. It, it used to be very much the case before 2018, the last two years, there has been very extensive cleaning uh, within organizations, but in the past we would have mailing lists, we wouldn't even know what their provenance was. But it's quite important if we actually obtain the data from the data subject to pretty be extremely clear as to what we do with the data throughout their life cycle. So I'll go back to the collection of data, but a, that's the fact of collecting the data is itself a form of processing. Once you've collected the data, you do things with them. So one simple thing is that you store them, you sort them, you clean them. And these are different types of, uh, let's say, data management uh, actions. And, and you can think of them in, in classic computer um, uh, computing, uh, the, uh, you know, computing approach. You would see them as read, write, and erase. So either you just access them, or you uh, change them, or you delete them. And each one of these actions constitutes a form of processing, which again has to be justified, it means to have a legal basis. And I will return to this one in a couple of minutes. And finally, it could be that you're actually sharing this data with someone else. A classic example would be uh, that you are in a consortium for a European project, you have collected data for seminar X, and then another research institute in another country um, wants to do a seminar uh, Y and you want to share with them the mailing list in order to share information. Now, this constitutes a form of data sharing and it's a different form of processing. So you have to have a legal basis again and an objective uh, for this one. What is important here is that whichever is the data, the legal basis you have for processing the data, it has to run across the life cycle. So it has to be there for the collection. It has to be there for the processing. It has to be there for the sharing and it has to be very specific. You cannot change the legal basis uh, unless you uh, actually you cannot perform a different type of processing unless you have a legal basis for this. And I will return to that. So what I want us to remember now in terms of processing, processing is pretty much any action, any act you perform in relation to the personal data. It's extremely useful to think of it analytically in three stages. This is an analytic device. This is not something that GDPR asks you to do but it's very helpful because you need to ask every time 
do I have a legal basis for performing a processing of that particular type? Now, the, uh, two more concepts are very important. Data controller. Data controller is the entity which is actually responsible for setting out the terms and conditions and the purposes for the processing of data. They have the control as to how the data processing is going to take place. And these are, in our cases, our universities, our research performing organizations, they are not the natural persons that perform the processing. So it's not the head of the IT services, it's not the X person. It is the organization as it is expressed by its administrative council, its board of directors, whatever it is that actually takes the decisions in accordance to its legal regime. Now, the data controller is the one that determines the purposes and means of processing of the data, but it's very frequent that the actual processing doesn't take place uh, within the data pro controller. It's not a data controller that performs the processing. It normally has someone else, another entity that does the actual processing, and that's the data processor. And the data processor is um, normally an entity that takes instructions from the data controller. And these instructions now, they have to be in writing and they have to be extremely specific. And there has to be to the level of the obligations of the data controller. So for instance, if there is a university and performs a, and actually conducts a, a seminar, again, the same scenario we had before, is it is a webinar and uh, it has too many webinars it runs because it's COVID, everyone runs webinars, every single professor wants to run a webinar. So they said, look, instead of us doing the whole thing, let's outsource this one to this fantastic little company we have in our town that does these webinars really well. And they will do the registration and the marketing and everything for us. Now, these are the data processors and the university is the data controller. And the university has to make sure that the data processor follows all the conditions and all the standards that the data controller does. You cannot hide behind your contractor. Another classic example uh, of a data processor is a cloud provider where you store your data. Uh, so Azure or, or Google or your national um, uh, information infrastructure uh, provider, they constitute data processors and you also have to be careful with the contracts you have with them in terms of the storage of the data. So it could be that in our scenario, you have a contractor that does the collection and the management and the sharing. Uh, the sharing is something that you do as a university and the storage, the long-term storage is being done at least in the technical level by uh, is being conducted by uh, let's say Azure or another uh, company. It could even be more layers in the stack. It could be an IT company that uses Azure and provides you a service to do that. All of them are data processors. You need to understand within a data journey from the uh, attendant to the actual completion of the whole uh, event, who are the entities are being involved and whether all of them adhere to the rules of uh, GDPR. Now, maybe very, a couple more minutes, yeah. sir. Yeah, I'll just go. I'll just go to one uh, more thing, which I think is really useful. Let me go this one here. I said before about the three stages. Um, it's very a classic situation is where I obtain the data. I have obtained the data um, under um, uh, legal basis one, uh, which is for for example consents. I process them. Again, I, or contract, I keep processing them, I do the data management under this contract. And finally, I may be sharing them either under the contract or under a legal obligation. For instance, this is an obligation against the, uh, which, which the European Commission has uh, uh, pushed me to have. Now, before I close, I want us to see very quickly the legal ba lawful basis for processing. We normally think that the uh, normal one is the consent. Let me uh, show you their, their aids, um, uh, legal lawful basis. There are six important ones and two uh, more specialized ones, two, six generic ones. Normally, we obtain data from our audience either through consent or through contracts, depending on whether the purpose of the processing is something which actually depends on a contractual uh, relationship or is just a consent. So when someone just attends a webinar, 
the legal basis is a consent. When someone pays in order to receive a webinar because this is a, a service that she receives, then the ba legal basis is a contract. Now, when I have received the data, but not directly from the data subject, but probably from another databases I may have, we could stretch the legal basis and say the legal basis is the uh, legitimate interest of the research performing organization because when you were giving your email address to the university for a specific event you may have we may have um, uh, you may have accepted the possibility that it's going to be used for other similar webinars so this is really important when when you use uh, email contacts that come from that you have obtained in other in different circumstances you have to make sure that they somehow relate they're relevant to what you do it cannot be that you obtain the data from a data subject to conduct a, a sociological research and then you invite them to an event uh, to listen to a computer science lecture. So it has somehow to, to link. Uh, and then, of course, there are obligations uh, following the, uh, there, there is the legal obligation, uh, lawful basis for processing, which means this is something that the law tells you to do. For instance, you have to keep a record of who entered the building because of COVID restrictions. For example, in, in, in Greece, in a number of institutions right now, you cannot enter the building unless you actually give, um, you, you provide your uh, ID. And then when you go out, you also sign out because that's a legal obligation could be asked by the Ministry of Health um, uh, in order to, to actually uh, resolve issues. I think these are the, I'm not going to go to the other lawful basis for processing because I think these are the most relevant in our context today. I'll share this uh, presentation. It's a very generic presentation, but it gives you insights as to different aspects of the GDPR, which you may find useful in your uh, daily activities. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Flor. That was very useful, very good background. Um, now Walter will uh, show Consent Wizard that uh, he and his colleagues developed. Okay, um, yeah, so thanks for the opportunity to show it off. Also the, uh, the Daria Consent Form Wizard, also thanks to Prodromos for the introduction of the data protection principles and so on, because much of this uh, is now already clear. Um, so I have to briefly do some advertising. Uh, we are the uh, working group ELDA, which stands for Ethics and Legality in the Digital Arts and Humanities. We are a working group out of the S3 Eric Daria EU, which is probably familiar to many of you and certainly to anyone at the Athena Research Center, uh, because there are many colleagues there that we are in very close touch with. Uh, if you need more information about this uh, European research infrastructure, you can find it at this URL. Um, now in Daria, there are a number of working groups, which are basically recruited from all the various members in various member states. Uh, the, the ELDA working group currently has people from, I think, 18 different countries uh, under its roof, um, which is great because it also gives us a very good overview of, on one hand, national problems and on also, uh, also on disciplinary problems because we have a wide range of people from actual lawyers uh, down to, uh, for example, cultural heritage experts and so on. So it's a very, very diverse group. Uh, what we're trying to do is we're trying to give recommendations, training materials, workshops and stuff like that regarding uh, primarily intellectual property rights and licensing, open licensing to be precise, uh, and also data protection and privacy and research ethics and scholarly conduct, because as you can see, in our designation, it's not just about legality, but also about ethics. And that's also, in a sense, how we understand our tool, the Consent Form Wizard. Uh, the Consent Form Wizard was developed as a tool for GDPR compliant consent forms for research purposes. But uh, we know by now that it's also being used, for example, by people in South Africa and in Australia. Um, because they think that while they are not obliged to do it legally, uh, the consent form wizard still asks all the right questions uh, and uh, you give that kind of information uh, to your data subjects because it's also ethically uh, the right thing to do and not just legally the right thing to do. 
If you want to have a look at what we do, you can find us at the URL elder.ipotes.org. Um, you can also find material from us there. And if you want to get in touch, you'll find our email addresses and our presentations as well. Right. Um, Programmers already told us about the principles of data processing to some extent and also about the rights of the data subject. And those are the two things that we want to reconcile with the consent from wizard. So that's kind of the outset of the whole thing. I'm sure you've heard about that before. Those are the principles for data processing as defined in the GDPR. So that's the only uh, basis on which you can actually process uh, personal data is if you take care of the lawfulness, fairness and transparency of the process, uh, there has to be a purpose limitation, so it has to be a clearly defined purpose. Um, it's about data minimization. Uh, it's about accurate data minimization means you're only supposed to uh, collect the kind of data that you actually need uh, for your purpose. Um, accuracy, the data has to be accurate. Uh, it can only be stored um, until the purpose is fulfilled. Uh, there has to be certain security measures and integrity around it, and it ha there has to be accountability on behalf of um, the controller, uh, for example, by uh, providing documentation and, uh, and registries and stuff like that. Uh, on the other hand, we have the rights of the data subject, um, information access, rectification, erasure, restriction of processing, data portability, and objection. Now, the most important thing, obviously, for us is information, because information has to be given to the data subject at the point where you collect the data. And that's a very important thing. And that's basically what the consent form uh, also helps you to do. Now, the grounds on which most of our reasoning is based in the consent form wizard itself is Article 89, which is kind of the flagship of GDPR exemptions for research purposes which specifically states that for archiving purposes in the public interest, scientific or historical research purposes, or statistical purposes, union or member state law may provide for derogations from the rights of the data subject. And I've already uh, given the, the, the rights that are concerned here, insofar as such rights are likely to render impossible or seriously impair the achievement of the specific purposes, which means um, that, uh, for example, if you gather data for a specific research study, it can, as long as it's for research purposes, obviously, not be withdrawn as it normally could be, which would be the restriction of processing, for example, um, if that renders your purpose invalid or basically would, would impair uh, your purpose or make the achievement of your purpose impossible. And much of this also goes into, um, into the uh, scenario that we are going to look at uh, in the coming uh, few minutes. So um, we developed the consent form wizard out of this general need that was brought to us by our research community and our scholarly community in Daria that the GDPR kind of uh, generated a lot of insecurity about these topics. The interesting thing is that uh, the protection of personal data is nothing new. There's no, nothing new about this. Uh, it has been uh, in national uh, legal codes forever, and it has also been uh, part of the Euro European Union uh, principles forever. Um, however, obviously, the GDPR kind of changed the game in the terms that it, uh, on one hand, defined a lot of stuff much more uh, closely and much more precisely. And it also made, uh, made it a lot uh, more, uh, let's say, expensive, basically, <laughs> not to take care of it, which was one of the major reasons why there was such, an, uh, uh, such a big uh, attention and, and uproar about all, the, all of this. Um, as we said, there are a couple of scenarios in research context or academic contexts, which seem to be more prevalent than others. And those were particularly gather data from and or about living people for research purposes in terms of a study, for example, in terms of an interview, uh, which might be online or, uh, or with a video interview or audio interview. Uh, gather data and consent for communication purposes like mailing lists, newsletters, and stuff like that, which Prodomos already mentioned briefly. 
And of course, there's also gather data and consent for hosting academic events, which is what we are going to look at in a little bit more detail in the next couple of minutes. Uh, having said that, I mean, what we originally thought we were doing uh, was addressing the scenario when you're hosting an academic event in terms of a conference, for example. Uh, so very much a, a, a larger context in, in that sense. But of course, uh, an academic event also applies to teaching. Uh, and it's in keeping in the many respects, at least with Article 89, with the research purposes, because uh, at least those who are uh, learning, not so much those who are teaching, but those who are learning actually do that uh, for their own individual research purposes. At least that's the way, for example, also in copyright law, intellectual property la uh, law uh, in Austria, Germany, and other European countries. Um, these exceptions are actually defined that for personal research reasons, um, you are allowed to do a whole lot of things. And in the same kind of, let's say, um, terminology, um, a teaching event or learning event can certainly be considered uh, within the research purpose. Um, so at this point, I'm going to switch over to the wizard itself. The URL for the wizard, uh, I've shown it here, uh, consent.daria.eu. You're very welcome to try it out yourselves, of course, and uh, go along. Uh, I'll just briefly show you the, um, the way it starts. Um, you can see here at the entry page that, uh, what we, that we explain specifically what the tool is and what it isn't. Um, because that's kind of important. Um, we are trying to give you a tool that will be valid and observing the articles of the GDPR. Um, so it should apply to any uh, research context or scenario that we, we provide here within the European uh, member states, European Union member states. Uh, and if you look at it from, a, from an ethical perspective, as I said before, it should actually go farther than that. However, there are some very specific um, regulations, national regulations, et cetera. Um, and you might end up, as you use the consent form wizard, at a dead end if uh, there are certain um, situations where either a consent, a, a regular or general consent form wouldn't really cover your purposes anymore, or if uh, the situation is so specific, for example, because you are um, processing um, sensitive data, as it used to be called, specific, uh, specific data categories now, um, where uh, the general form might not be sufficient. Um, so that's also something uh, that the wizard does. It kind of tries to explain some of the steps as you go along, some of the terminology as well, uh, and uh, yeah, kind of introduce you also to um, the thought process behind